Operations is Mission Control. Are you ready for the event? Ready for the event. Hey, Tom, this is Jared from 30 Seconds to Mars. Can you hear me? Hey, Jared, read you loud and clear. Great to hear your voice. Welcome on board the space station. Thank you so much. Uh, you look happy and uh, healthy floating around there. Yeah, feel feel happy and healthy. Uh, everybody's taking good care of us up here. Just finished a weight workout, actually, after a, a day of uh, working on experiments, so it's been a lot of fun. So is it the end of your day right now, the beginning of your day? What's it like for you right now? So right now it's mid-afternoon. Uh, we're on Greenwich Mean Time. I woke up, uh, started after breakfast, started doing uh, a bunch of experiments in the Japanese module, the Kibo and actually uh, setting up a series of experiments that will be going on over the next couple of weeks. Uh, had lunch, uh, continued on with the work in the laboratory, uh, had a couple of workouts, and uh, here we are in the middle of the, middle of the afternoon now. It's interesting. Do you have to work out a lot up there? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you do. Uh, you know, being in space in zero gravity where your body doesn't have to work at all uh, to stand up, to sit down, or even to lie down, me floating in space is more relaxing to the muscles than even lying in bed uh, on Earth, uh, since we don't feel the effects of gravity. So we would we would turn into jellyfish probably if we uh, we didn't work out. We work out on a treadmill right here to the side of me is a cycler ergometer, a stationary bike, uh, if you will, and we have a great resistive exercise uh, device. Uh, we can lift up to 600 pounds. I can't do that, but uh, one could. And uh, so we're working out the bones and the muscles to keep them all strong. It's pretty important to be functional when we get back home. So you sleep really well up there? Oh, you know, it's, it's probably different for different people. Um, when I first got here, I was so excited and uh, so much that I wanted to do that um, I did not sleep just great. It's kind of like if you're really busy at work and you have deadlines or that kind of thing, it's a little bit hard to sleep. But as you progress, as your body gets used to floating as well and not lying against a bed and your head's not against a pillow, as you get used to that, uh, the sleep becomes just wonderful. Oh, that's amazing. And uh, what, about, uh, what about eating? How often do you have to eat? Do you have to eat extra calories while you're up there? Or? You know, we, we listen to our bodies and eat when we're hungry. The, uh, we were told that we can lose weight if we don't work at it. There's something about, we don't quite understand it, but something about living in zero gravity, even though we are floating a lot of the time, maybe it's all the workouts we do, uh, but we need more calories than we think we do. And so we eat a good bit. We have this pantry that's just stocked full of stuff. Uh, we can eat whenever we have time, and there is time set aside for each meal of the day. So we, we work it in. The food's great. What about dreams? Uh, what are your dreams like up there? Are they vivid? Uh, are they different? You know, I've uh, talked to a lot of astronauts about that, and my dreams have not changed. But I uh, understand a lot of astronauts have floating dreams. That's typically the, the most common kind that are different. Um, well, I take that back. I did have one floating dream. I was outside uh, the space station, uh, not in a spacesuit, floating around the outside and looking at it. Uh, and that was, it was a little bit uh, exciting, a little overly exciting at the time But uh, when I had the dream. But uh, it was a lot of fun, actually, too. Does it feel spacious up there? You know, it, it actually does. So you're looking at this module here, and we're surrounded by outer space just on the on the sides here in the top and the bottom surrounded by outer space all around and it, you'd think it'd be kind of confining but the the space station is about the size of a five bedroom house and you can uh, you don't have to stand on the floor I can use the the wall as a floor I can be up on the ceiling so you actually have more space than you think you do uh, it's easy to move around we can float by each other uh, sometimes we move these racks up and we obstruct the area completely but we can still uh, easily uh, float on by. So actually it feels quite spacious. I, we don't feel, uh, I don't feel confined in, at all. Well, that's amazing. Do you ever listen to uh, music while you're up there? I do. Uh, during workouts is the uh, most common time, I think, when people listen to music. Uh, sometimes, uh, not me, but others might listen to music while they're working on their laptop, something like that. 
Uh, so uh, music's very much a part of our lives up here. Uh, Chris Hadfield is a musician himself, a performer, and uh, so he's been playing and recording some music up here. Uh, but um, uh, quite a few astronauts actually uh, play instruments. I, I play a little classical guitar myself. But uh, listening to music helps us get through the workouts, and uh, for some people, it might help them relax at night as well. Got it. Did, did you uh, did you get the CD from a, a, a little band called Thirty Seconds to Mars uh, with a song called Up in the Air? Did you get that? Did it make it up there? Oh my God! <laughs> oh, that's Do you mean great. this CD? <laughs> Uh, it's now doing something it could never do on the earth. Oh, man. That's incredible. That's amazing. The CD is flying up here. Very, very cool. That's, well, that's a, that's a, that's a moment of, uh, uh, that we'll never forget right there. Thank you so much for spinning that around. We've been wondering uh, and thinking about that <laughs> a lot. That's great. That's wonderful. We found it surprising that you guys oh, yeah, are you know, listening sure to was... CDs, too. Oh, yeah, we have, uh, we have that. We have uh, other devices, you know, just uh, can uh, listen to WAV files, that sort of thing. But having a CD around is, is very nice as well. I, I actually wrote a little note to you guys. I hope that you got it. It was in the CD uh, 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 alongside it. Sure did, Red. Uh, it, was, it was very nice. Really appreciate it. Uh, we pulled it out and read it after Kevin had left. He didn't have a chance to see it. Uh, but Chris Hadfield had a chance to read it, and Roman Romanenko, our uh, Russian colleague. And when three more come up, we'll have a chance to read it as well. But it was very nice. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, on behalf of me, Jared, Shannon, and Tomo from 30 Seconds to Mars, we're really so proud to uh, have shared this with you guys uh, here at NASA. You, you you teach us time and time again that the impossible is indeed impossible, and and keep pushing on the limits of uh, of, uh, of technology, and uh, it's just such an amazing and inspiring thing that you're all doing. I'd love to ask you a couple of questions uh, that we gathered from fans around the world, if that's okay. Oh, please, yeah, that'd be great. Um, what, this is from at Mars Mummy. Uh, that's the Twitter handle. What's your most memorable moment on the ISS? That is really hard to say, but I there's two that I think you know in you know 20 years from now that I'll still be thinking about. Uh, one was my last few seconds on my spacewalk uh, that I did when I was on the on a shuttle flight up here on a construction mission. And it was my last few seconds on my last spacewalk and just looking down between my feet down at the Earth. And I believe I was looking at the Kamchatka Peninsula on the eastern coast of Russia and looking at the mountains in the Alpenglow. And uh, that was a spectacularly beautiful moment, but a poignant one for me because I, I didn't know if that would be the last spacewalk I'd ever do. And as it turns out, it probably was. The other moment, uh, most of us share our best moments with a colleague. And another moment was looking out the window uh, looking at the East Coast with a storm again at sunset, there was uh, lightning uh, in the storm. You could see greens and blues and yellows and oranges uh, in the lightning, uh, but the lightning was buried in the clouds, so it was just these tufts of, of light scattered all around, uh, and it was just uh, breathtaking. Uh, I really felt at that moment almost like an alien looking down at Earth, seeing something that otherwise you just couldn't see. So I'll certainly never forget that, particularly because I was able to share it with one of my uh, crewmates. That's um uh, at Elena uh, underscore decast says, if you could choose to live either in space or Earth, which would it be? You know, I spent my whole life being curious about space, and uh, I'm, I'm very lucky, very privileged to have that curiosity satisfied. There's always more to learn, but uh, as wonderful as it is, as it is up here, it, we all kind of agree. We look back at the Earth and we fall back in love with the Earth again. Um, and uh, so, yeah, my, my place is uh, feeling, the, feeling the pull of gravity, my feet on the ground, uh, not only because my family is, is there, my friends are there, but, you know, that's where we came from, and that's kind of where our bodies are, are tuned to belong in a lot of ways. Uh, it'll be a very exciting thing when uh, people are able to leave the Earth and go somewhere, but I think we'll always long for the Earth and look back at it with, uh, with wonderful memories, and uh, uh, certainly the Earth has taken very good care of us in getting us this far. 
Uh, here's another uh, question. Uh, does the time, this is by uh, uh, Art Sistab. Um, half a year in the ISS is a long time. How does the time go by for you? Is it, is it quicker or uh, slower? It's amazing, Jared. The, uh, we have a saying up here that the, the work week consists of a Monday and a Friday with only just a couple of hours in between. It goes by so fast you wouldn't believe it. Uh, mostly because every moment is, is interesting and exciting. Just, you know, it's, it's exciting to talk to you. It's exciting to float this microphone in front of me. Uh, nothing ever gets old, but mostly because we have meaningful, uh, very intense work to do in, these, in all of these laboratories. And you know, we're seeing amazing results every day. We, we don't understand them all, but we relate them to the scientists on the ground who are figuring out what it all means. Um, and it's just uh, it's a whirlwind of activity that is intensely exciting. And of course, time just flies by when that happens. What's one thing that you'd love to see happen in space that hasn't happened in space, besides get up in the air? Um, if you mean as a nation, uh, We'd love to uh, get back outside of low Earth orbit. Uh, as low Earth orbit is an important place to be to learn how to how to do space flight. So you can we can mature as a spacefaring nation. But uh, regardless of the destination, whether it's Mars, an asteroid, or the Moon, um, I think everybody's looking forward to to uh, getting back beyond that and seeing those photos and hearing the voice of the person that looks back and sees the uh, Earth as a sphere, as a ball again. Um, that's an incredibly meaningful moment, and looking forward to that happen again. Uh, have you seen anything unexpected or strange uh, out there? What's the weirdest thing that's ever you've ever seen up there? You can tell us the secrets. It's okay. We won't tell anybody. Well, oh yeah, yeah. No, there's there's the outside the window strange things, and the in, and inside the cabin. Um, the aurora uh, australis and the aurora borealis are the two things that uh, that really takes your breath away the first time you see it. It's, it looks very alien, uh, just uh, curtains of of this subtle faint green glow that that dance and move around as you uh, come close to the poles in your orbit. Uh, I saw a shooting star, uh, my first one actually, and that was uh, under me. Uh, it's between you and the Earth that you see it happen, go through the atmosphere. And usually you don't see anything moving except the slow motion of the Earth going by. So that, that's striking to see that. I think uh, one of the strangest things, it's a perception issue when you get up here, uh, your eyes aren't used to seeing the movements that you see here. And uh, when I first got up here, a colleague, a crewmate, went flying by me and for a split second, my brain said, that's got to be a cat, that's got to be a panther. This big thing that's just sliding by you like that. And of course, you see it and you know what it is right away, but the perception for a split second kind of makes your heart jump and you go, what was that? And you go, oh, it's just my crewmate. Uh, so your perception gives you a lot of strange uh, alien feelings when you're inside the cabin as well. Wow, so is there an up and down for you uh, at all? Do you kind of orientate yourself to a certain uh, direction once you get familiar with the equipment and the inside of the, uh, of the space station? There are parts of the space station where there is no up and down. You, it's kind of like you're a hamster inside of a little tunnel. But places like this, you know, it might look to you like there is an up and down. But I've got a, the galley right behind me that's on the ceiling. And the longer you spend up here, the less you care uh, what the name of the surface is. They're all the same. My feet might be on what we call the deck right now, but it could be a ceiling. It could be a, a wall. It could be anything. Uh, really, and as you adapt, you get used to that, and you can just spin around and, and orient yourself very easily. So could, there's just a lot more space. Could you show us what it's like, no, no what it's like to be upside more down? Spend here. And actually, I'm not upside down. The camera's upside down. Now the camera's attached to the ceiling. Okay, great. And uh, I'm on the floor. Oh, so I as like you get adapted, you find like that out right away. Nice. Uh, there's a question, have you ever danced in space and will you show us what a little dance is like right now? Okay, the uh, answer to the first one is no, I have not danced in space. And uh, therefore I can't show you any dance that I would do, but there are certain things you can do in space that uh, dancers cannot do on the ground. Uh, 
it's not fair because I don't have to deal with gravity, but it's something like this. <laughs> and being scientists, we we love the demonstrations of angular momentum as well. So uh, that's, uh, great. that's always fun to do. That's great, wonderful. Uh, do you often hit your head in uh, space? That's a question from uh, uh, Julia Julia twenty three. Julia Julia twenty three. That is a great question, and the answer is yes. Unfortunately, especially when you first get here, and then it's probably like a skier or a, a toddler learning to walk. Uh, the more confidence you get, the faster you go, and then you have to learn your lessons all over again. Um, so I don't, I don't whack my head on hatches anymore, but um, you know, you get busy, you lift your head up and you might hit a laptop. You see things all around us. So yeah, your head, head gets used to getting bumped quite a bit, and the, the more experience you get, the more you learn to look behind you uh, before you start to move around too much. Um, uh, I, we have one minute left, so just a couple more quick questions. Um, being up in space, does it make you think about humanity differently? Absolutely, because the world is so beautiful from what we see, but we don't see um, the activity of the humans down there. Uh, we read about it, and it's, uh, all astronauts say this. You see the Earth, there's no borders. Uh, the atmosphere is only just about a, an inch thick if you hold your hand out and, and do your fingers like that. So it's, the Earth is an incredibly fragile, precious place where the humans live. And uh, so it, it, it gives you a lot of love for not only the planet but for the humans on it. And uh, you wish, sometimes I wish we could uh, uh, behave better sometimes down there, but ultimately it gives you a lot of uh, a thrill and a lot of confidence in the future of the human race. Well, our band is called 30 Seconds to Mars, and uh, someone wants to know if we'll ever actually be 30 Seconds to Mars. Oh, I, I think it's, there's no question at all. The question is when. Uh, Mars is uh, kind of a sister or a brother to the planet Earth, along with Venus. Uh, a lot to learn there, and that seems to be a, a logical place for humans to go someday. So I, I think there's no question we will be. Well, maybe you can make a dream come true and just say our band name from space one time so we can have it blasted out to the universe. Well, Jared and uh, Shannon and Tomo of 30 Seconds to Mars, great talking to you today. Welcome on board the space station and uh, really enjoyed uh, having a few moments with you. Thank you. It, it, you've made a dream come true, all of you guys here. So, NASA, thank you. We love you guys. We'll see you, see you next time. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much. We're all waving to you and, and, and smiling uh, uh, ear to ear. This has been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see you another time. Thanks so much and safe travels. Thank you very much. Yeah, y'all travel safely too. And space, this is uh, Mission Control Houston. This concludes the event. We're now resuming operational audio communication.